is the magic of Star Wars? Why is it, of all the great franchises, the most universally beloved? Um, well, for me, I was a Star Wars fan. I was seven in 77. So I was that kid. I'd been on the other side of the table for a very, very long time. And I always got Star Wars was my thing as a kid. And it, uh, it has continued, you know, it's continued through the generations. What's been interesting about the revival of it is that when The Force Awakens came out, it was a film that was made for people my age, people my father's age, and the children that are watching it now. And so I think it's, what's really nice is it's captured those kind of old myths and, and, and those legends and, and that sort of spirit of adventure which is carried on through the new, the new movies. Um, for me, it's, those, it's, a, it's a big family thing. And that's what I really like about it, is that it's, it's generational and it can and will continue to be so. Can you talk a little bit about the technical challenges of bringing life to such a unique creation? He, um, BB-8 obviously came from the mind of J.J. Abrams and he did a very, very quick sketch which was as then now become such a familiar, a familiar character, and they would. JJ always wanted it to be realised practically. He didn't want to do it as a digital, and he wanted there to be something tangible there that Daisy Ridley and the other actors could act against and with. So that we went down the puppetry route. Neil Scanlon, uh, Josh Lee, and Matt Denton. They, they kind of got their heads together and they, they wanted to do this thing practically. And I did some really early tests. And um, old school puppetry was. was the initial way they went and the way we used it in a lot of the movies and then there were seven seven versions of it completely in the in the, in the force awakens there's now more um and so we used every trick in the book i mean there was animatronics there's <coughs> good old-fashioned rod puppets there's a lot of digital work being done with it and we decide which version to use as myself and dave chapman who's the other puppeteer that works on this and we pick the version of BB-8 that best suits the shot and the action we're doing. So if he's running really fast through the desert, that's me pushing him. If he's being used um, for close-up work, there's an animatronic one on a plate which we use. There's versions with wheels on the back and sometimes we can't achieve what they need and that goes digital. So the, the, technically, it's, 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 every tool, it's every tool in the box. People are maybe less hardcore fans. Can you start by telling us a little bit about where you fit into the franchise and what it means for you to be part of that legacy? To be part of the uh, the, the family of Star Wars is, is a dream come true. So I'm a diehard fan, and to be part of it, is, it really has been a dream come true. So for me, it's it's been a journey. I've been involved with different projects, and when my agent rang me and said there's a there's a there's a, there's a small film called Star Wars that's being filmed, I just you know I would do anything to uh, to be part of that. And luckily, got through the. Uh, the strenuous audition process and, and, and made it through. So yeah, for me it was a dream come true. Um, well, I play um, uh, the, the the captain on Darth Vader's uh, Imperial destroyer on his ship, and uh, I, I was a fan as a kid, and I can remember um, when I was a bit older, being at drama school, sitting with my mates in our, in our front room in our shared house watching videos of the original Star Wars movies and we were like do you know what I'd be really happy just to be that guy you know mm. who's got a couple of lines and he's you know do, he's one of Vader's men or he's uh, he's flying an X-wing or something like that and then 20 something years later uh, I get to be that guy you know <coughs> a little part in uh, this extraordinary uh, series of movies that uh, it, it was like a like a, a boyhood fantasy come true for me to to be a part of it and to step out onto that stage and so much of the set was real was physical and the shiny black floors and the, the, the corridors and everything and uh, and then Darth Vader turns up on set <laughs> and you're going, oh, it's actually Darth Vader he's real and big and scary and uh, it was really kind of uh, exciting it was it was like an ex no other experience I've ever had on a on a movie set and it sort of almost felt kind of slightly separate to my acting career in a way this is just wish fulfillment happening uh, and uh, I, I loved every single moment of it and it was great that everyone I met that was involved with the film uh, were like proper fans of the movie and Gareth Edwards that directed it um, came up to me at lunchtime 
I, my bit was shot right near the beginning and he was still trying to come to terms with his own excitement <laughs> over the fact he was directing a Star Wars movie. He's like, dude, we're making a Star Wars film. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to try to just keep hold of that excitement in order to be able to do my little bit in it, you know, and not be overwhelmed and overawed by it. But it was a really, a really special thing that I'll treasure. It's very easy, I think, when you're filming, uh, if, you're, if you're an actor who's got a bit to do, you, 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 um, you're just going to work, you know, and uh, you can learn the lines and you make sure you know what's happening and the camera's there, don't look down the lens if you can remember, uh, and that sort of stuff. But then when the first assistant director shouts, right, I'm gonna give you two cues, uh, I'm gonna shout, uh, action and then there's going to be a pause and then I'm going to shout X-Wing and that's when you duck. <laughs> you think, okay, so that's fine. And then when you've got a guy shouting X-Wing on top of his voice and you have to go like that, you suddenly think, yeah, that's the coolest thing I've ever done in my whole life. <laughs> and seven-year-old me is jumping up and down now and, you know, yelling with excitement. Um, what Brian said I thought was very interesting, I think that when you grow up uh, with the Star Wars movies as a child and then you get to be in one years later, of course everybody on the set at every level is that person. And so when you find yourself waiting around for, for the camera to turn over and you fiddle with a, a few LEDs and a, an old fan that's been picked off a recycling tip, you know, that the art department have made, they were the guys when, you know, when the movie first came out at school going, oh my God, this is amazing. But the guys who made the, the original sets in Elstree in 70, 76 were, were just getting old bits of old computers and just gluing them onto circuit boards. And yeah, that looks like what the side of a spaceship probably looks like in my head. And now that's what spaceships look like because these guys invented that. And now the art department are now recreating what they did in 76. Mm -hmm. And there, there are worlds yeah. within worlds of Star Wars and it's created this whole... This is what spaceships look like. They've got shiny black floors and windows that have that kind of parallelogram shape and that's just what they are. And once you're in that world and you step onto it for the first time, even if you're a, not a Star Wars fan, you can't help but feel affected by the, the kind of resonance of the years and you think, oh my God, this is exciting. And the sheer level of technical uh, wizardry as well, uh, I remember when we were on set on a destroyer, they had flown all the glass out of the windows so that they could shoot through them and then there were GoPro cameras shooting us from outside to map our reflections back onto the glass. Uh, but then because there were going to be X-Wings uh, shooting destroyers and explosions in the sky, they had to get the light in our eyes and the reflection on our faces, so they had flamethrowers outside the destroyers. And they were f shooting 20 feet of flames into the air so that our eyes would reflect a little bit of the light so that when they shot that back on, mm. they're just like, yeah, 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 amazing, mm. thrilling. I realized earlier this year that it's now 20 years um, since I first got involved with Star Wars um, and the realization dawned on me today that still I'm having what I refer to as pinch me moments um, I, and today in fact was somebody was pointing at a photograph I have with me with the seven characters that I portrayed in the prequel trilogy and I just had this almost out-of-body experience when I said to myself, you played seven characters in a Star Wars trilogy. How did that happen? You know, it was almost as if it has happened to someone else, not me, but it did. Um, so that's my personal sort of uh, wide-eyed amazement. You know, I was a, a small lad of 21 when I first saw Star Wars, and I wasn't in the film business then. Um, uh, it knocked my eyes out and it's continuing to do so for different reasons. Um, and two other stories to reinforce this enthusiasm and you know, sense of wonder people have about Star Wars. Um, I was working on a film that shall remain nameless um, sometime in the past. Uh, but there was a guy there, he was an extra I got talking to in between takes. And he wasn't an actor. He, you know, and he didn't want to be an actor, but he had, all he had wanted to do was a, a comment you made. He wanted to be in a Star Wars movie. And he had taken a week's leave from his job, uh, signed up with this agency that he had heard was providing extras for the film. And for that week alone, that's, he had given himself over to it. I said, are you enjoying it? He said, yeah, oh, it's great. I said, so you're going to do some more of this? I went, no, no. It's, you know, I just want to be able to say that I was in a Star Wars film. And then he's gone back to his day job. <laughs> um, at the other end of the spectrum, 
Um, I was working on uh, the Jedi Council scene in The Phantom Menace and sitting next to me, to my right in our little director's chairs, was Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, he was reading a book and then very quietly he took his glasses off, folded the book and his head fell into his hands and I thought, oh, is he not feeling well or something? You know, so I said, Samuel, can you? And through his hands, he just said, I won't attempt to do the voice. But he just said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm OK. I just can't get over the idea that I'm working with Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of BB-8, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, because obviously having established such a fantastic range of abilities in the first film, um, if there are particular things that were especially challenging with that and, and how that journey's been? What, in with what he does in the next one, yeah. Um, I can't really talk about that very much, I'm afraid. He's uh, he plays, uh, let's just say he has a significant role, uh, R O double L, and um, <laughs> yeah, see what I did there. Uh, no, he's he's he uh, he's he's along for the, he's along for the adventure again. Um, I, 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 I can't talk about it with um, from a technical point of view, same again, but more. Um, there was a you know a few new challenges, and again the the guys at Neil Scanlon's Creature Shop have absolutely picked that ball up and run with it. And um, he does. I think Ryan Johnson described him as the Buster Keaton in the movie, and uh, he does he does some good fun stuff. And that's really all I'm prepared to say about that. <laughs> I mean, obviously you can't talk about the specifics of the film, mm -hmm. but you can talk about the wonderful privilege of getting to work with yet another incredibly talented visionary behind the camera. Oh, well, Ryan's um, is yeah. just brilliant. I mean, there's a, there's a line in the trailer that says this doesn't go the way you think it will, uh, or is this isn't going to go the way you think it is, and it isn't. You know, that is a whole that is a stamp for the whole film, and um, it's people are going to be really surprised. And he's done he's done. Really, quite. He's done something special that, um, you know, JJ set that thing up again, and then Ryan's taken it and taken it somewhere else, and then JJ's going to come back and you know do his other thing after that. But um, he's done. We were very surprised when we read it, and we really liked it. So I think it's. I think everyone's going to really enjoy it. Well, there's a sense of continuity, obviously, mm -hmm. throughout the films. But can you talk about for you the, the comparison between working with JJ and working with Ryan? They're very different people, and they're very different directors. Uh, they. They both love Star Wars, and they're both really smart guys, and they know what's going to make this work. Um, they, I don't really know how to describe them, but they, they're both brilliant in completely different ways. But they both have an eye that, when you look at the frame, you go Star Wars. So that's what I mean. That's what's really lovely about it. It all looks. You just you just look at the setup with nobody in the frame. It just, it just looks like a Star Wars film. And um, Ryan is a, again. He's, a, he's 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 much quieter. He's got very very quirky sense of humour. That's not to say that JJ hasn't, but he's a, Ryan has a laugh that you may have heard recently on a making of thing that <laughs> is uh, is you can hear across the set, which is always good fun. We did a lot of work with Daisy. Um, I first met her very very early on in the in the pre-production, and I said, "Oh, I'm going to be BB-8," and she said, "Are you going to do the voice on set?" Because she was quite worried about getting nothing back. So I would do the dialogue for her on set. As, uh, so it, it was it was interesting because I've got the green suit on and I'm usually about, f with the puppet version, I'm about three and a half, four feet behind BBA in the scenes. And I have to be in that scene, but not in that scene at all. So I don't make eye contact when we when we perform. And, and so you just kind of keep us, you, you think small thoughts. And um, there are a few bits and pieces that we did, we worked up, little bits of business that involved the um, the aerial and stuff, and it, which didn't end up making it into the full film because every time she would see BB-8, she'd check his aerial just to make sure it's like it's like kind of ruffling the hair on a dog. And very early on, again with with some of the screen tests with BB-8, I was standing next to it and I thought, oh, it's kind of like a dog. That was where I sort of started that thought process from. It's like like a like a, like a, a sort of tenacious Yorkshire Terrier mixed with a toddler. So within that, he's Poe's dog, but then he gets lost, so he kind of goes along with Ray, and it's, it, it's, it's a bit of a backwards and forwards for that. So if you, if I, I always think about him as being a really loyal dog, um, and that kind of, I think, I hope that kind of comes across in the, in the performance. I mean, it's interesting you say his Poe's dog in the first one. I mean, there's that sense of longing and that sense of, you know, kind of his, <clears throat> can you talk about um, how you create that with the, the limited range of motions he has? Well, he, he um, as opposed to R2, because R2 
it's got a head spin and, and Kenny would do lovely things making him wobble and stuff but you can take that same performance and you can change the sound a lot of it was done Ben Burt did most of art who's acting in a sound edit so you can take that movement and have him you know, jiggling around and, and, and make that angry noise, R2 angry noises, or you can take that off and you can put R2 scared noises, but you've still got the same movement. With BB-8, just just by popping his head down, you can make him look sad, or you can make him, you know, you, I've got I've got you know various controls on the head. So by making him look scared, you can just cock his head, and uh, and. You, the, the, you know, when, when he finds when he f- thinks that Poe's dead at the beginning, just by slowly dropping the head and then turning him around and, and taking him out very slowly, you can you can you know, use it to you know, to be sad or there's there's a whole range of emotions you can get just by moving that head slightly. Plus, doing the noise at the time helps everybody relate to that. So, we spent myself and Dave Chapman spent a, about I don't know two weeks in a soundstage with the various puppets and a video camera, just working out what it did well, what it didn't do so well and just finding out which version we would use for, for, for what action, I mean, whether it was coming downstairs or running away or just, you know, being angry, whatever. So he he has quite a nice range of movement, so you can get the whole, you know, you can pitch and roll and you're on the head, and I can operate the body from the back. So by combining those and just checking them back on video, you can, you can, you know, you can make human emotions out of something that has no human emotions. Um, and even to the point where if I just vibrate my hands, that vibration goes down the rods and just rattles the head so you can make him look nervous. So it's those little tricks that you just bring onto the, you bring into camera and then that's, you know, there's your performance. It's that easy. Has anything ever gone wrong? Has he ever run away down the stairs or um, dropped down a hole? Not <laughs> really, no. I'm um, just trying to think where there have been any of that. I mean, we had a lot of trouble with him in sand. I mean, the, 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 the first when we first got out of Abu Dhabi, it was so hot the glue was all giving up. So all the panels were starting to come away. And poor Matt and Josh had to get in there with a hoover every day and take all the sand out after filming and it would fill up and just, that was that kind of thing. I don't think if we had any major problems. Um, not really, I mean, the, the technical team, they're so good. They kind of, they, they had planned for a lot of, you know, a lot of the inevitabilities of this stuff. Um, I ran it into a few things. I did, I, I did, um, I ran into a bunch of uh, crates at one point during a take. And then we, we finished. I said, I'm sorry, JJ, I hit the crates. He went, I hit them every time. It shows you there. Which is a practical effect thing again. A practical effect thing again. You can, you know, you can actually affect the, um, the, the environment you're in. And he liked that. that people then go, that's a real effect. Um, but we didn't have any major kind of malfunctions on the Force Awakens. Before we let you get back to the people here today, um, do all you guys, do anyone have any particular special messages to the fans of Star Wars, um, people who love the work that you guys do and are so very grateful that um, you make this world for us? Uh, well, I am one of them, so I'm just I'm happy to be part of it, and that there's some great stuff coming, so keep watching. Pretty much the same. Uh, keep going. We're, we're all diehard fans ourselves, so uh, thank you for all the support for the fans, but uh, it's, it's going to get better and better. I'm fairly sure about that. Uh, yeah, it's a privilege to be a part of something that touches people's lives in, in that uh, incredible way. So I'd just like to say thank you. I'm very grateful for that. Mm, nothing to add to that. Um, thank you, George. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. From all of us. <laughs> <laughs>